The third Tajali is concerning arts, crafts, and sciences. Knowledge is as wings to a man's life and a ladder for his ascent. Its acquisition is incumbent upon everyone. The knowledge of such sciences, however, should be acquired as can profit the peoples of the earth and not those which begin with words and end with words. Great indeed is the claim of scientists and craftsmen on the peoples of the world. Baha'u'llah. God has endowed man with intelligence and reason whereby he is required to determine the verity of questions and propositions. If religious beliefs and opinions are found contrary to the standards of science, they are mere superstitions and imaginations. For the antithesis of knowledge is ignorance and the child of ignorance is superstition. Unquestionably, there must be agreement between truth, religion, and science. If a question be found contrary to reason, faith and belief in it are impossible. Abdu'l-Baha. So this week, we're so happy to have Dr. Kurosh Mohanian, and his topic will be, are the Baha'i writings on evolution consistent with science? Dr. Kurosh Mohanian is a principal scientist at Global Health Labs, a sister organization to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Mahanian leads the development of artificial intelligence tools to address the high burden of disease in low and middle income countries. He's worked on AI for the diagnosis of childhood pneumonia, cervical cancer, and malaria. Most recently, he's working on AI enabled obstetric ultrasound to improve antenatal care for babies and mothers. Prior to Global Health Labs, Dr. Mahanian served as a research associate professor at the Knight Campus for Accelerating Scientific Impact at the University of Oregon. He's worked at the intersection of AI and biomedicine for over a decade with research positions at Charles River Laboratories and Citic Corporation. He has also applied AI to problems in semiconductors and defense at KLA Corporation, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and Boston University. He earned his PhD in physics at Cornell University and a BS in physics and mathematics from the University of Pennsylvania. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Mahanian. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the, uh, as, as Paymon has said, are the Baha'i writings and evolution consistent with modern science? It's a, it's a very important question, one that we'll be exploring. But first, I'll just give a very brief introduction to the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith is a religion that was founded in Iran 180 years ago. Um, the primary message of the Baha'i faith is the unity of humankind. Um, one, another important belief is that the religion is progressive. God reveals the truth to humanity through a series of messengers progressively over time because the needs of humanity change over time. So we can see that in the Baha'i teachings, even religion evolves. It's not static and one time forever. It evolves over time according to the needs of humanity. So let us begin our presentation. I'm going to start the slides. Um, so my talk is um, largely based on a paper that uh, my friend and collaborator Stephen Freiberg and I wrote over 20 years ago, and um, I have added a few little things to it, but we'll primarily be drawing from, from this art article. Um, I just want to say at the beginning that I'm not a biologist, I'm a physicist, and so I'm not an expert in this material, but the things that we're going to be talking about is something that will be accessible to anyone with uh, some background in science. So here's the outline of what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to cover the conflict between science and religion. And this primarily is, is over evolution. That's like the, the, big, hot, the big hot button. Um, then we're going to talk about the harmony of science and religion, which is a primary, a very central teaching in the Baha'i faith. And then after, after doing that, we'll talk about the themes that are can be found in Abu Baha's writings on um, evolution. They primarily occur in three different uh, volumes, uh, Some Answered Questions, The Promulgation of Universal Peace, and Paris Talks. There are some points in Abdu'l Baha's comments that may appear to be um, at, at variance with the scientific view. We're going we're to cover that and talk about potential resolutions of these, of these points, and then finally end with a conclusion. So when Darwin 
published um, on the origin of species uh, in 1859, the reception to it was mixed. Some people immediately recognized the value and simplicity and explanatory power of this theory and readily accepted it, you know, for example, Huxley. But um, the scientific establishment in England, at least, was largely dominated by Anglicans. Some of them were even like Anglican priests. Uh, they, it did not go over well with them. Uh, they opposed it immediately, and you know, the cartoon kind of showed you people's reactions. Um, what, what are the religious objections to the theory of evolution? What, what are people objecting to? Well, um, one of the main ones is that uh, the theory of evolution explains the creation of, of species, including humans. And this usurps God role, God's role as the creator of life and humans. Um, another thing is that it undermines the existence of purpose. If 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 everything can be explained with these, you know, laws that are that are have nothing to do with uh, active creation, then you know, what happens to the concept of purpose? And then, of course, if people take the Bible literally, the theory of evolution contradicts it. Now, this controversy has raged for 164 years. There have been groups that have been, you know, even today in 2024, there are people who are very much against the the, uh, the theory of evolution, and they still some of them hold views like that the Earth was created just 6,000 years ago, and all the, all the species of animals that we see on on the planet today existed from the very beginning 6,000 years ago. And then the, the these views range all the way to a totally materialistic view, which is what you know most evolutionary biologists are, espouse right now. So the principle of the harmony of, of science and religion is a central principle of the Baha'i faith. It's uh, it has a lot of implications, and I and I've just divided up the this into seven different aspects. This teaching, and we're going to go over each of these. Uh, science is humanity's most noble virtue. Religion and science are both based in reality. There's only one truth. The power of reason is required to perceive and understand reality. Beliefs that contradict science are superstition and ignorance. We heard that quote from Bayan earlier, which, which covered those two. Faith in something contrary to reason is impossible. Religion and science are both needed for human progress, and the harmony of science and religion will lead to world peace. So we can see this is quite an important topic. It's not just academic. Um, I, I should say, the reason why we're really looking into this teaching is because it bear, brings to bear on the question of, of Abu Baha's comments on evolution. And it puts into perspective what he said about evolution in the context of, of the entire Baha'i teachings. So Abu Baha said, the virtues of humanity are many, but science is the most noble of them all. The distinction which man enjoys above and beyond the station of the animal is due to this paramount virtue. It is a bestowal of God. It is not material. It is divine. Science is an effulgence of the sun of reality, the power of investigating and discovering the verities of the universe, the means by which man finds a pathway to God. That's really astounding. Science is the means by which we can find a pathway to God. Um, I'm going to be reading a lot of quotes, so please be patient. I, I really want to um, read the direct quotes from Abu Baha's writings, and so, so it's not filtered to, to my brain. You hear his words directly. The second principle, both science and religion are based in reality. Abu Baha said, religion must stand the analysis of reason. It must agree with scientific fact and proof so that science will sanction religion and religion fortify science. Both are indissolubly welded and joined in reality. The third, the third aspect of this teaching, reason is required to understand reality, both science and religion. We can't abandon reason when we think about religion. We need to use our reason to understand it. Consider what it is that singles man out from among creative beings and makes him a creature apart. Is it not his reasoning power, his intelligence? Shall, we, shall he not make use of these in his study of religion? One, one additional thing I want to point out is that uh, we, we'll see a lot of um, uh, male-specific gender. Uh, we will talk about man and he. These are not meant in a gender-specific way. This is just because of the limitations of the English language. These are 
These are universal that apply to all humans. In, in Persian or Arabic, the word for man would be insan, which is, which is not gender specific. The fourth aspect of, of this is that any belief that contradicts science is superstition and ignorance. This particular thing that Abu Baha said can be found 18 times in Paris talks and the promulgation of universal peace. So you know it's very important that Abu Baha is asserting the, the, in a sense, it's like the priority of reason over religion. If there's a religious belief that contradicts reason, it's probably not true. He said, if religious beliefs and opinions are found contrary to the standards of science, they are mere superstitions and imaginations. For the antithesis of knowledge is ignorance, and the child of ignorance is superstition. It is impossible for religion to be contrary to science. God made religion and science to be the measure, as it were, of our understanding. Put all your beliefs into harmony with science. There can be no opposition, for truth is one. So therefore, the, the question that we're pondering, are the Baha'i writings and evolution consistent with science? is like asking, is the Pope Catholic? It's, you know, it's, the answer is obviously yes. So it's, we have to modify our understanding of those writings in order to see their, their consistency with science. The fifth aspect of this teaching is that faith in things contrary to reason is impossible. Abu Baha said, I say unto you, weigh carefully in the balance of reason and science, everything that is presented to you as religion. If it passes this test, then accept it, for it is truth. If, however, it does not so conform, then reject it, for it is ignorance. If religion is opposed to reason and science, faith is impossible. And when faith and confidence in the divine religion are not manifest in the heart, there can be no spiritual attainment. Um, in in um, the Tablet of Ahmad, Baha'u'llah says, thus have their superstitions become veils between them and their own hearts and kept them from the path of God. This this reminds us that superstitions can be a veil between us and God. Both science and religion are needed for human progress. Abu Baha said, religion and science are the two wings upon which man's intelligence can soar into the heights with which the human soul can progress. It is not possible to fly with one wing alone. Should a man try to fly with the wing of religion alone, he would quickly fall into the quagmire of superstition. Whilst on the other hand, the wing of science alone, he would also make no progress, but fall into the despairing slough of materialism. So there needs to be a balance between science and religion. If you have only religion, you'll, have, you'll end up in superstition. If you have only science without religion, then you're gonna end up in pure materialism and despair. And we'll, we'll see that later on when we talk about the, the Abu Baha's comments on evolution. And um, this balance is both on a collective level and a, and, a, and a personal level. The seventh aspect of the harmony of science and religion is that this will lead to world peace. When religion, short of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas shows its conformity with science, then will there be a great unifying cleansing force in the world, which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggles, and then will mankind be united in the power of the love of God. This is a powerful statement and one which deserves exploration of its own. We don't have time for that right now. So we'll just note it here and continue with our exploration of, of Abu Paz's comments on evolution. Um, I have divided his comments on evolution into seven themes. This is a little bit arbitrary. It's just, um, themes that, that can be seen in, in his writings. And it's not as if these themes are each distinct. They kind of blend into each other and they're connected to each other. And so we're going to cover them in this order, but there are by no means a linear a linear progression from, from one through seven. Um, and you'll see that often there's overlap between these, between these terms. And again, please remember that when we see the word man here, it's not meant to be hu male humans, it's in any human is just referred to as man. Creation is perfect. Life evolved gradually from a soul origin. Diversity is necessary. The human form attracts the human spirit. Man is distinct from animals. Evolution is governed by universal law, and man is a necessary existence. When we carefully investigate the kingdoms of existence and observe the phenomenon of the universe about us, we discover 
the absolute order and perfection of creation, the dull minerals in their affinities, plants and vegetables with the power of growth, animals in their instinct, man with conscious intellect and the heavenly orbs moving obediently through limitless space, all are found subject to universal law, most complete, most perfect. I think no scientist would disagree that the laws of the universe are perfect. Otherwise, they wouldn't spend so much time investigating them, trying to understand them. Um, but nevertheless, this is one of the main things that Abba Baha said. This, this idea of the perfection of creation is reflected in the writings of um, the physicist Paul Davies. He said in the book, Are We Alone?, it almost looks as if the structure of the universe and the laws of physics have been deliberately adjusted in order to lead to the emergence of life and consciousness. The, the fundamental constants of, of the physical laws of the universe, their constants are so finely tuned that if you change, change just one of them by a percent, they, it would lead to basically a universe without stars, without galaxies, without life. And often this principle is called the anthropic principle, and it very much mirrors this, this uh, Abu Baha statement that the universe is perfect. The second theme, life evolved gradually from the soul origin. Abu Baha said, life on this earth is very ancient. It is not 100,000 or 200,000 or 1 million or 2, near, 2 million years old. It is ancient indeed. The origin of all material life is one. The terrestrial globe was created from the beginning with all its elements substances, minerals, parts, and components, but these appeared only gradually. First the minerals, then the plants, then the animals, and finally man. But from the first, these kinds and species existed, but were undeveloped in the terrestrial globe, and then appeared only gradually. Um, ancient life and, and gradual evolution are foundational concepts in, in, in science, and Abba Baha does not dispute them. His statement about the if these kinds and species existed this is not immediately obvious what it means, but we'll explore this late, later on. Third theme, diversity is necessary. The order and perfection of the universe require that existence should appear in countless forms. There must be differences of degrees and stations of kinds and species for existence to shine forth with the utmost perfection. This statement is Ababa expressing the importance of biodiversity in the language of his own time. Um, we are keenly aware of the need for biodiversity right now, and, and all of us are concerned about whether it, it's in jeopardy. The fourth theme. Abba Baha said, the members, constituent parts, and compositions that are found within man attract and act as a magnet for the spirit. That is, when these physical elements are gathered and combined together according to the natural order and with the utmost perfection, they become a magnet for the spirit, and the spirit will manifest itself therein with all its perfection. This is very um, reminiscent of a concept in the modern field of self-organization. It's as if when, when something very complex comes together, it manifests new properties. Uh, properties, these are called emergent properties, properties that were not there in the constituent parts. So um, my friend, Stephen Freiberg, he, he said, sand and computer chips are both made of silicon, but the complexity of computer chips give it emergent properties that are not found in sand. Uh, this is kind of a, just an analogy to understand this idea of emergent properties. If things get very complex, then they start to exhibit properties that we didn't see in the simpler system. Um, the book by Stuart Kaufman is, is a the laws of self-organization in complexity in the universe. The fifth theme, man is distinct from animals. Abu Baha said, man has remained a distinct ancestor. That, that is the human species from the beginning of his formation in the matrix of the world and has progressed gradually from form to form. It follows that this change of appearance, this evolution of organs and this growth and development do not preclude the originality of the species. So this, this particular um, aspect of Abu Baha's comments on evolution is one of, one of the most difficult to understand. It seems to imply that either humans existed from the beginning of, the, of life on Earth or that humans evolved in parallel with other life forms. Um, Abu Baha himself 
explicitly stated, we saw that in that other quote, that humans had not existed from the beginning physically, but they were there potentially from the beginning. And many, many readers of Abu Baha's comments on evolution have came, come to the conclusion that Abu Baha advocates some kind of parallel evolution, the human line being a distinct line of evolution separate from the other animals. Um, I'm going to bring up a few concepts that helps us to see that these interpretations may not be the correct interpretation because they contradict what we know about science, what we know to be true of the history of life on Earth. Um, one is, I'll read this, the, the final quote, is that Abu Baha said, the reality of man is his thought, not his material body. The thought force and the animal force are partners. Although man is a part of the animal creation, he possesses the power of thought superior to all other created things. So maybe Abu Baha is more talking about the mind of man rather than the body of man. Maybe the mind of man has a, has a separate separate existence than, than the body. And in fact, Abu Baha says that um, the mind of man is supernatural. It's, it's, it's a bounty of God. It's not something that comes from his animal nature. It's, it's a separate thing that is that is sort of uh, an emergent phenomenon that is not part of his physical evolution. Um, in fact, this is the co-discoverer of, of evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, believed this, that everything about humans that physically could be explained by the theory of evolution, but that the human mind was not, was not explained by the theory of evolution. This is not a popular concept among biologists, but um, nevertheless, this is what some people believe, and um, Abu Baha seems to be advocating that the mind is what is separate from man's physical evolution. Another thing is this concept of latency, that things can be latent, so they exist in the beginning in a, in a latent form, but not, not physically. They didn't manifest immediately. Um, Abu Baha uses analogies to, to convey this concept, like the tree being latent in the seed, or the human is latent in the embryo. You can't see the human in the embryo, but it's there. It just needs time to express itself. And so maybe Abu Baha is saying that these latent potentialities were there from the very beginning. They only manifested through the process of evolution over time. Finally, the, the third thing is the word species. I don't think we're, we're to understand the word species in its biological sense. He's not using it as, as a, you know, the biological term species. It's more like the word, uh, um, um, akin to the word kind. In, in Persian, it would be the word no, which Abu Baha seems to be saying that humans are a different kind of creature than animals. And that kind of creature is original and unique. The um, anthropologists are a paleoanthropologist, Ian Tattersall, which, who, who has found many ancient human re remains in his book, Becoming Human, he said, with the arrival of behaviorally modern Homo sapiens, a totally unprecedented entity had appeared on Earth. Homo sapiens is not simply an improved version of its ancestors. It's a new concept, qualitatively distinct from them in highly significant, if limited, aspects. This seems to mirror what Abu Baha is saying about about humans being a different kind of creature. The sixth theme in Abdu Baha's comments on evolution is that evolution is governed by law. He said, similarly, the terrestrial globe was created from the beginning with all its elements, substances, minerals, parts, and components, but these appeared only gradually, first the minerals, then the plants, then the animals, and finally man. But from the beginning, these kinds and species were latent in the earth the realm and appeared gradually thereafter. So the supreme law of God and the universal natural order encompasses all things and subjects them to his rule, to its rule. Abu Baha tells us that everything evolves. In, in others of his writings, stars, galaxies, planets, life, civilization, science, and religion, they all evolve. And this happens, the, the law of evolution is a universal law that apl applies across all scales across the universe. So it's not just applied to the evolution of life on Earth. Um, things always start simple, and they evolve towards greater complexity. 
The complexity was there in the beginning, but it was latent. Evolution is unfolding of that latent complexity through the, the laws of nature itself. Abdul Baha says, thus as this composition and combination has been produced according to a natural order and subject to a universal law, it is clear that it is a divine creation and not an accidental composition and arrangement. Um, that last statement is something which we'll talk about because it is a point of a difference of opinion, even among scientists. The, the last and final theme, man is a necessary existence. Abdul Baha said, it is through the appearance of the spirit in the material body that this world is illumined. Just as the spirit man, of man is the cause of the life of his body, so is the whole world even as a body and man as its spirit. If man did not exist, if the perfections of the spirit were not manifested and the light of the mind were not shining in this world, it would be like a body without a spirit. Abu Baha is saying that the purpose of evolution and all of creation is the appearance of man. Man is possessed of mind, which is like a spirit to the body of the universe. This is kind of an analogy. If you compare the universe to the body of a human and man to the mind or the spirit, the human spirit, the human spirit is what makes us alive. If man did not exist, the universe would not be alive. And I think Abu Baha is not talking necessarily about Homo sapiens, but an intelligent being worthy to express the human spirit. In one of his writings, he talks about um, the stars and other planets, and you know whether it's the cows. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the the, the quote exactly, but clearly his meaning that the term human is not just about Homo sapiens, but it's about it's about intelligent beings that can recognize their creator. We're going to explore this question more in the discussion. So let's review um, these seven aspects of Abu Baha's comments on evolution and assess where we are with respect to their agreement with, with science. Um, so the first one, um, creation is perfect. I think this is, we found it's consistent with the idea of a fi the fine-tuned laws of the universe that give rise to the universe that we see. Life, life evolved gradually from a sole origin. This is one of the pillars of, of the science of evolution. Diversity is necessary. That mirrors the idea of biodiversity being essential to, to healthy ecosystems. The human form attracts the human spirit. We've seen that that, that is reminiscent of the ideas in, in uh, self-organization and complexity. Man is distinct from animals. There seems to be some dissonance in, in that, that one. We're gonna, we're gonna discuss that a, a little bit later. Evolution is governed by universal law. This is largely very acceptable, but there is an aspect of it about the inevitability of humans that we'll discuss in the next one, in number seven, man is a necessary existence. So let us, let us dive into this. But before we do, I want to cover some of the prerequisites for understanding Abu Baha's writings on evolution. First of all, we can't just take individual passages from his writings or his talks and and draw conclusions from just those single passages. We have to consider all the Baha'i teachings in order to understand Abu Baha's comments on evolution. Um, in, a, in, a, um, in a letter that was written on behalf of the guardian of the Baha'i faith in 1946, someone asked the guardian about the theory of evolution and whether it was consistent with science. And here's what uh, was written on his behalf. These various statements must be taken in conjunction with all of the Baha'i teachings we cannot get a correct picture by concentrating on just one phrase. And let's also keep in mind this very important principle that Abba Baha was adamant in, in expressing over and over again, that religious beliefs that contradict established science is surely superstition. And so we, we have to be careful not to understand Abba Baha's words as contradicting established and known, known things in science. And then finally, you know, what was Abu Baha trying to, to do? What was he, he, in his comments, was he, was he trying to, you know, be another evolutionary biologist and, and sort of come up with his own theories of evolutionary biology? Abu Baha was trying to tell us of the spiritual dimensions of our, of our scientific um, aspirations and, and theories. What are the spiritual dimensions and what implications 
do they have and caution us not to take a materialistic view of, of the universe because science isn't the same as materialism. Science is a way to understand the universe, but it's not the same as saying the physical is, only, is the only thing that exists in the universe. So now we can dive into the into um, these these points of dissonance between Abdullah's comments and science. So on, on the theme five, man is distinct from animals. Abdullah said again, there are those men, there are men whose eyes are only open to physical progress and to evolution in the world of matter. These men prefer to study the resemblance between their own physical body and that of the ape rather than to contemplate the glorious affiliation between their spirit and that of God. This is indeed strange, for it is only physically that man resembles the lower creation. With regard to his intellect, he is totally unlike it. Um, you can see in this book by Jared Diamond, a very popular book, he calls it the third chimpanzee. He considers humans as just being a, another um, species in, in, the, in the genus of the chimpanzees. It's interesting that in Victorian times, to say that there was any relation between humans and chimps was, was an insult. It was, it was preposterous. And today, the uh, modern biologists, they revel in this idea that, that humans are just chimpanzees. It, it's how far have we come? Very interesting. Abu Baha also said, although man shares the same outward powers and senses in common with the animal, there exists in him an extraordinary power of which the animal is deprived. All the sciences, arts and inventions, crafts, and discoveries of realities proceed from this singular power. So we're now ready to go on to the next theme, um, man is a necessary existence. Um, and this is dissonant with some people's views, but not everyone. Um, in particular, the two, two, two physicists, Freeman Dyson and Seward Kaufman, who we encountered earlier, they both they both have said that the, there are things in the laws of nature that would give rise to something like a human being if given the right conditions. Um, Freeman Dyson said, the more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Stuart Kaufman, we will have to see we are the natural expressions of a deeper order. Ultimately, we will discover in our creation myth that we are expected after all. Um, on, on the biologist side, um, I think it's a little bit different. The, there's less acceptance of this idea that the, that the humans are inevitable to outcome of evolution. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould famously said, wind back the tape of life to the origin and let the tape play again. And the replay would populate the earth with a radically different set of creatures. The chance that this alternative set will contain anything remotely like a human being must be effectively nil, with, while the probability of any kind of creature endowed with self-consciousness must also be extremely small. This is, I think, the probably the majority view in, in evolutionary biology, but not, but not the only one. Edward Wilson, who's a very eminent um, evolutionary biologist, he thinks that the evolution of intelligence is likely given, given the right conditions. Um, ultimately, we cannot do this experiment to redo the tape of life. So I've never met any extraterrestrials. I don't know anyone who has. And until we do, there's really no, no way to, you know, we just have an example of one, one planet. So we don't really know this answer for sure. And so a lot of this is just speculation. On the other hand, there is, there is this observed phenomenon of convergent evolution. Evolution tends to converse, converge back on the same solutions over and over, even from a restart, like you know these, these major um, extinction events that have occurred throughout the history of the Earth. S creatures that were very similar to the previous ones come back again and again. Um, this is known as conversion evolution, and, and it, it sort of lends credence to the idea that evolution does have very consistent pathways. The, the science of self-organization also lends lend some support to the idea that, that there are these fixed states in nature that evolution visits through this random process of exploration. Dissonance seven, 
so this is really relating to man, man is a necessary um, existence, but it's more about like the, the question about purpose. What, what, does, what does evolution say about purpose? Here again, also opinions are divided. Um, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reasoning or any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we would expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Richard Dawkins is a is a kind of a evangelical atheist and advocates very strongly for no purpose, no God. In, in, and his main argument is evolution depends solely on, on chance. But I think there are a lot of people who don't think that chance rules out the idea of purpose. Um, in that same passage where the, where the guardian um, responded to, to the person who asked about evolution, he said, we don't believe man has always had the form of man, but rather that from the outset, he was going to evolve into the human form and species and not be a haphazard branch of the ape family. Um, Abdul Baha said, the world is like a tree, the mineral kingdom is like the root, the vegetable kingdom is like the branches, the animal kingdom is like the blossoms, and man is likened to the fruit of that tree. The tree is but for the fruit. If the gardener did not expect the fruit, he would never plant the trees. So Abu Baha rejects these ideas that, that evolution is, is without purpose and, and without any, any, any direction. The direction of evolution is, is set in the laws of nature. It's, it's, it's embedded in the laws of nature. And, um, it, and its purpose is to, to create a being that is like humans that can recognize its creator and have, have a mind that's similar to God's mind, God's mind. Um, this tree imagery is something that uh, clearly implies the common descent that all the branches of the tree are related, but it also brings home the point that, that man is the fruit of, of, of that tree of existence. Um, it, just in the interest of time, I won't cover this slide, but uh, I was talking about about um, the the um, randomness, not necessarily um, contradicting the idea of purpose. There there is a there is a book you can read about that. Uh, we can talk about that in the discussion if there's time. So here are the takeaway messages from uh, Abu Baha's comments on on evolution. Life has a single origin. Evolution is a universal law. It operates according to the, the, the laws of the universe. It turns potentiality into reality. The human species is original. By species, we mean the essence of humans. The reality of humans is, is the thought, the human spirit. And original just means unique. Humans are different from animals in kind. The human mind is unique and unprecedented. Didn't exist before. It's not to be found in anywhere else in nature. And the human spirit is our both our pathway to, to know God and our pathway to, to science. Human existence is necessary. It's not, we don't exist ac accidentally. It's there on purpose. And, and our existence is built into the laws of, of nature. Um, human existence, again, is purposeful. And we exist so that the divine perfections may be man man made manifest in, in the physical universe. So I conclude with this um, passage from The Secret of Divine Civilization, which Abu Baha wrote, wrote very early on in, in his ministry. He said, before all else, God created the mind. From the dawn of creation, it was made to be revealed in the temple of man. Thank you very much. Those are, the, those are uh, my remarks, and we can have a discussion now. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Thank you so much. So if people have questions, um, you can put it in the chat and we'll have some time to have some Q&A. Um, the first question is, which are the best writings to read that explain these concepts? Well, if you want to read the, the, the words of Abu Baha himself, they are to be found in those three books that I mentioned at the beginning, Paris Talks, The Secret of Divine um, Paris Talks, the promulgation of universal peace and some answered questions. Um, you can search in some answered questions. The the um, the topics are are laid out 
by by the title, so you can see which ones concern the appearance of of, of, of man and evolution. In promulgation of universal peace, there are, are a few talks where Abu Baha talks about um, evolution, and if if necessary, I can I can send um, to the to the organizer of, the, of this um, forum. I can send wh which ones those are, uh, and so you can see them. And also, there's there's a few in Paris talks where Abu Baha talks about science and religion, and about um, evolution. Thank you. Um... Can you talk more about materialism versus science? Yes, sure. Um, well, you know, materialism is a very broad uh, term. It applies to many things. You know, materialism is another name for consumerism. Um, it's also referred refers to the idea that um, there is no such thing as as non physical things. Materialism is is a common conviction of of scientists, particularly you know evolutionary biologists, um, and uh, and any explanation that involves something that's not material is is kind of unacceptable to them. But of course, you know they're looking at very efficient causes. You know, if you're looking for the the cause of a particular phenomenon, like why did this this cell, this immune cell, engulf this particular you know um, bacterial invader? You're going to look for material causes of that, but if you're looking for things like purpose, you may not find a material cause, and the the cause may be something that's non-material, and the human spirit is something that it, that is non-material. God's God's mind, the 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 will of God, is a non-material entity, and materialism is a, is a, is an idea that holds that non-material things don't exist that only material things exist. And I think this is something that is really antithetical to, to the idea of, of religion and, and spirituality in general, that the, the, our bodies are just vehicles for the expression of, of the human spirit. We are not just our bodies. Our bodies are just a vehicle for expressing our, our human spirit. Um, and, and creation is a vehicle for expressing you know, God's purpose. The purpose that there that he have creatures that that worship him and know him, we we see this in the in the um ob, the short obligatory prayer that thou hast created me to know thee and to worship thee, so we can see that as being a, a statement basically of the of the purpose of all creation is that we can know know God, and that knowledge is a non physical entity. Our knowledge of God is through our human spirit. Does that get at the um question i think so if the person has maybe follow-up questions they can ask um the next question is what do the what does this theme evolution promise in the future well i i think uh we if we just step back a little bit and just talk about um the harmony of science and religion we, we saw that abu baha says this is a the lack of harmony is something that causes is it can be a cause of war. If if people can't agree on a on a rational approach to religion, then what happens is that they come to very very differing beliefs about about reality, and these different beliefs about reality can lead to conflict. And as we know, the the world right now is rife with conflict. So if we can all agree that that we exercise rationality in the study of religion. Then I think we can bring an end to some of these conflicts that are just due to pure irrationality and misunderstanding and 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 a, and a, and a reluctance to accept basic laws of, of reason. And and so evolution in particular, I can go further and to say that if we accept the materialistic view of evolution, that humans have no purpose and that we are just animals, I, I think this is a very uh, a corrosive belief, because if we see humans as animals, what do we see in the animal world? We see a lot of conflict and violence, and there are many people who think that human beings, as being just another great ape, are just inherently prone to violence, and um, and there's no there's no resolving it because it's in our genes. You know what can you do if if you're genetically programmed to be violent, then then. And there's no really no 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 hope for humanity. 
But if you see that humans have a, have a spirit that is transcends the, the, the body, then we can start to see the, the, the potential for, for world peace, the potential for humans to overcome their differences and to, and to love everyone as brothers and sisters, then I think we can see that, that this is very impactful. It's not just about you know, an academic idea. It's about who we think we are and what we're capable of. We are not, we are not what our, only what our genes tell us to do. We are, we are more than that. We are, we are powerful beings because of our human spirit and we can do whatever, whatever we put our minds to. Our minds dominate our physical nature can dominate if we allow them to. Does mind mean consciousness and spirit? I think consciousness and spirit can be seen as um, the same, but mind is really the fruit of the human spirit. Mind is not, mind is, is the human spirit give rise to the mind. We're, we're, we're not for the human spirit. We wouldn't have a human-like mind. Of course, animals have minds too, but their their minds are are not. Um, they animals don't come up with theories of physics or or understand the history of the universe or or have it, inquiring minds to know things about how the universe works. And so, I think mind is 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 a is a kind of a the manifestation of of the human spirit in in our in our in our being. The next question is, what do the Baha'i writings say about the evolution of man's mind? How it evolved to arrive at the great discoveries and the sciences, and most importantly, to recognize a world outside himself? Well, the, the Baha'i writings tell us about the educators of humankind. Um, and remember, we said at the beginning that in the Baha'i faith, the educators of humankind don't come and reveal all truth to us all, all at once. You know. Um, uh, these educators have come throughout human history and they gradually reveal God's purpose to humankind through the ages. They cannot all at once tell us final truth because we're, we don't have the capacity for it. But in one of Baha'u'llah's writings, he says that the, his revel is, revelation is, is, is only... He only tells us the things that we are, we have the capacity to hear. We don't have the capacity to hear his full revelation. If he did reveal to us everything that God could reveal to us, we would be overwhelmed by it and we would, we would basically perish. And so God's revelation comes to us by degrees because our capacity is developing by degrees. And so our discovery of ourself as, as a conscious being, I think we always had a sense that we were that we were there was something outside of ourselves that that was important. You can see this throughout history. People had very, very um, elementary ideas of of what you know. They had belief in many gods. They believed in 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 you know a lot of things that we consider now very superstitious. But they were they were ways that human beings explained their existence, their purpose, and and how things came about. Because we have science now, we see some of those things as being being you know superstitious, but our, our understanding evolved over time. Mainly our spiritual understanding developed through the help of these divine educators like, you know, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, the Bab, and Baha'u'llah. The next question is, if man at times in his evolution looked similar to an ape, was he nevertheless always a separate species? Well, um, that that's a very uh, complex question. I I tried to kind of cover that. That seems to be what Abu Baha is saying, but I would I would urge us to think about it a little bit differently. Um, we you know we have not always existed on this planet. Human beings, you know, if we take our most basic characteristics, you know, we stand upright, we think, we build tools, we we do art. We have not existed for you know, at most maybe five million years. Um, so before that, we, di we didn't exist. There, there was no such thing as a, as a human being. And then after that, we looked very different. You know, we were, maybe our bodies were hairier. We, you know, we had a protruding jaw. 
nevertheless, at the point where human beings were distinct, that we were really distinct from 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 the apes. There, there are there are there are in the fossil record there there are um, there are creatures. You know, one of the most oldest is Ardipithecus. You know, five million years ago, there was this thing which stood upright and was different than an ape. It maybe it partially lived in trees, partially on the savanna, but it was it was different, and maybe it didn't have a very a very advanced mind, and yet it was it was different than than an ape. And so, at what point that the human spirit was present in that creature, we don't really know. And you know, largely it's a it's a it's it's kind of maybe not necessary to know exactly when that occurred. I think the important thing to know is that the human spirit dwells in us now and we are different from from animals and we have a we have a greater responsibility and we have we have we have that responsibility comes from our great power that comes through our human spirit and we have to use that responsibly and not you know basically destroy the earth through our power which we could easily abuse by destroying the planet or destroying each other What is the best evidence slash explanation for the concept that nature and evolution is goal oriented toward the appearance of man? Oh, um, well, um, I think that this concept of uh, convergent evolution is something that that um, that is a evidence in favor of the idea that. It, it's not that evolution is goal oriented. I mean, goal orientation is something that, as as conscious creatures, we 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 you know we we say, oh, I want to go to work today, so I I get up, I eat breakfast, I get in the car, and I go to work. That's goal orientation. You know that that there's purpose in evolution is something that along the lines of this. Evolution operates according to universal law, and the outcome, the natural outcome of these universal laws are something that's intelligent. For example, there are many phenomena uh, in, in, in biological creatures that, that completely rely on random mechanisms, you know, um, transport of things through the cell membrane to, to, to the cell for, for, you know, for nutrition, uh, the immune system. There's all kinds of random mechanisms in in biological um, beings, and yet biological beings are very very purposeful. You know, they 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 strive to 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 live, to survive, and to reproduce. So, regardless of the mechanisms of evolution, there there can be purpose built into the laws. The laws themselves are not conscious, but the the direction is built into the laws. It's not purposefulness in the sense of conscious purpose. Purpose and that conscious purpose is something that God built into it, but the laws are there and they they operate. And by the way, the 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 Baha'i writings they, they don't support this idea that there's miraculous interventions in in evolution to create create um, create humans. This is something that you know creationists believe that that there are these miraculous interventions. Even the people who espouse something called intelligent design. They think that that um, organisms like humans or any organism is just too complex for evolution to come up with on its own. So th there has to be these miraculous interventions. And, and the, the Baha'i writings don't support that. The Baha'i writings say that these are built into the laws of nature. Abba Baha says that, that nature cannot deviate from its laws by one iota. There's no deviation from the laws. And nevertheless, these laws give rise to diversity, creatures that are that are that all do all kinds of things, plants, bacteria, animals, and humans. And so the purposeness is built into the laws, not necessarily as, as if the laws had consciousness. Are you aware of any Baha'i related scholarly papers that approach evolution in terms of cladistics? I am not aware. Of, I am. I am not familiar with any any Baha'i scholarship on cladistics myself. <laughs> He's not aware either. So we're not aware. Okay. <laughs> I know cladistics is something that's um, 
uh, it is it is a concept in biology which doesn't have uh, universal acceptance. I think it's one of the ideas that that um, sociobiologists uh, that they 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 espouse that that idea, uh, but if that is not you know universally uh, accepted. Um, like for example, I don't think Dawkins Dawkins is uh, someone who's who's bought into that. Uh, whether there are any Baha'i commentaries on that, I, I don't know. Was Adam a manifestation, and could he have looked like an ape? I, I think Ab Adam is a is a is a metaphorical uh, concept. I don't think I don't think it's there was any such person as as Adam. Um, I, I think if you, especially if you read at a, uh, the Some Answered Question, Abdul Baha's gives some very good good a very good response to this question of Adam and Eve. And that these are just allegories for understanding spiritual concepts, and they're, they're not physical to be taken literally. And you know, there, there's in in the in the spiritual scriptures of the past, there, there, a lot of them are largely written in allegorical terms because human beings didn't have a scientific viewpoint. And so, um, you know, Moses um, couldn't couldn't tell tell you about the theory of evolution because people would have just not understood what what that that idea, and so you know the, the idea of Adam and Eve is is basically the way you would explain something to someone with limited understanding, and so I don't think it's to be taken literally. Will it ever be possible to clone humans? I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I, I think you know sheep have been cloned. And uh, I think that there was an there was an experiment in in South Korea where someone someone tried that, but I, I I'm not 100% certain of that. I I think that if we if you follow the basically cloning as a way of just sort of like um, using the mechanisms of biology to to do what it normally would do, just just using a different genetic blueprint. And if you can if you can manage to do that, then I don't think you're going to see any difference between that and 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 and, and, or, and a human being that was created, you know, through through the natural way. Because all that remember that what Abu Baha said is that it's the combination of elements that makes us human. If those exist, then it'll be a human. And so if human beings manipulate things in a test tube to do what what would have happened anyway in in in, in a natural birth by just replacing that genetic material, then I think that person is every bit as human as, as anyone else. The human spirit will, will exist in that person just as well as it would with, with anyone else. At what point in mankind's evolution did his soul and mind manifest? Well, I, I think even there, I think, you know, the, 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 this idea of that you know, things don't get manifested at once. You know, Australopithecus walked upright, um, but I'm sure the mind of the Australopithecus was not that advanced. It's not known that Australopithecus even used tools. So clearly the mind of Australopithecus was much more, much less advanced than the mind of, you know, something like um, a million years later, Homo habilis, who did, who did use tools. And so even the mind itself, the capability of the mind also evolved over time. Um, the 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 first evidences of the human-like mind occurred about maybe a hundred thousand years ago. You see evidences of of art, cave art, you know, um, trinkets and things people wearing, uh, and also it, it's clear that Neanderthals also use tools, but it's not clear. Um, whether they learned anything like maybe burial of the dead and stuff like that from their modern human counterparts who lived at the same time in the same places. I read that there were about five distinct early human species that then coalesced into the dominant Homo sapien species. Is this true? It depends on what you mean by coalesced. Um, I think that you, if you look at the human genome, there's we have a um, a couple of up to a couple of percent of Neanderthal genes in us, and that of course depends on where you're from. If you're from Africa, it's very unlikely that you have any Neanderthal genes. If you're from Europe uh, or the Middle East, it's highly likely that you have some something like two percent of Neanderthal genes. Um, 
but the idea that these these things coalesce, I think that's not an accurate idea. There were many, many human predecessors. I mean, um, probably in, in the at least in the in the, in the dozens. Um, uh, but you know, the genes that we have today consist of you know Homo sapiens genes, Neanderthal, and the, there's there's a couple other ones, Denisovans, and um, and I I forgot the name of the other one, but um, we find those genes. It's not clear whether those genes are doing anything to us. We know, for example, that Neanderthals lived in Europe for 500,000 years or more. And we know during that 500,000 years, there was um, glaciation periods. Um, these ice ages, they came and they went every 100,000 years. So Neanderthals were very adept at surviving uh, in, in those kinds of conditions, you know, in the ice ages. And so did Europeans inherit some of those genes that helped them survive uh, is it the extreme cold? It's likely. I don't, I don't think we know whether the genes that we got from Neanderthals, Neals, from Neanderthals do give, give Europeans that capability, but it's possible. Do you think men and women have evolved differently and will do and do so in the future? When you say evolved differently, I, I, do, I, I don't think human beings are all the same. There's to distinguish, you know, in, in evolutionary terms, you know, men and women. I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. For for species that reproduce sexually, they they always have a male and a female, and they, and they're you know they have different um different like goals that are driving them. You know, the females largely, and if you look in nature, they're driven by making sure that their young are are safe, and that they want to nurture them and protect them. And the males sometimes cooperate and then sometimes don't. In some species, the males they stick around and they and they help. Like in birds, for example, they they often the male will will stick around and help raise the birds. In 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 our live you know our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, they you know the males have harems. One male has many many females that that uh, and and you know there's one there's a practice that occurs amongst gorillas and and chimps is infanticide. In, where the where the alpha male he will kill the babies of of the some of the of a female in order to be able to mate with her because that may have, that baby may have come from a, from a different father and he wants to be the the one who who gives rise to the offspring so he killed the female so I don't think we want to draw moral lessons from chimpanzees I'm sorry they 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 live a very brutal life and 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 to notice a behavior in chimpanzees and say see it's it's natural human beings can do it too. I think that that's really going about the wrong way. Um, and, and so even in those chimps, the female does everything in her power to protect those babies from not being killed by that alpha male. But if, if the alpha male kills the baby, then she has no choice but to, but to mate with the alpha male. And, um, and, and you know, the, the, in lions, lions are also a so social creature. The females are, if you look at their characteristics, they're they're very protective of, of their babies, and they will they will resort to any kind of violence to protect them, including confronting males, you know, to to stop them from 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 committing violence on their on their babies. Could there be humans on other planets that have another form different to ours? I I believe so, absolutely. Um, it's interesting the the the, the scientist E.O. Wilson in his uh, one of his books I think 2016 um, the uh, you know on on the meaning of being a, the meaning of human existence he says that intelligent life is very probable on other planets and it, they're likely to have many features in common with ours if you think think about it you know basically evolution is exploiting the different opportunities that exist because of the laws of nature. Why do, what, you know, the eyes evolved independently 17 times, completely independently. Why? Because light exists, light is, is one of the properties of, of, of the universe and you can extract information from, from images. And so um, evolution learned to exploit that, that, that mechanism and to figure out what's going on. And you need that in order to survive. 
And so you, you see you see eyes in, in everything from sea creatures to mammals. Um, there, there, there are light sensitive bacteria. So this idea of being sensitive to light and try to extract information from it is a very common theme. And you can see this sort of this idea of convergent evolution where, where evolution learns to exploit uh, mechanisms in nature to its own advantage. And, and so, um, so, so uh, creatures on other planets, they will be living to, according to the same laws. The laws of physics don't, don't vary by where you are. And so if the conditions are right, then, then they will, the, an intelligent creature would evolve to exploit those same things. Communication is a need for, for social creatures. So they probably have some kind of language and they need to, they need to sense, sense what's going on in the environment. So probably smell is another, another characteristic. Well, whether they would use a nose like ours or, or, or ears to hear on the side of the head, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear. There, there is some difference of opinion on this. Not all biologists ascribe to the idea that that um, that creatures on other planets, intelligent creatures, would look like us. Of course, in science fiction, often they do, but that's probably just because of lack of imagination. So the next question is asking: Do the Baha'i writings say that without the human soul, the body is not able to live? As God alone can create a soul, then even if a human body could be made by man, as it would not have a soul, it would not live. I I I, I don't see it that way. I think Abu Baha was very clear that um, that once the configuration of components is human, then it'll attract the human spirit. So I I don't believe that that a clone would not have a soul. I I don't think that that that's just my opinion. That's the way I read Abu Baha's writings. But it is it is true that the Baha'i writings say that without the, the human soul, that we wouldn't we wouldn't be alive. The, the the you know we would we the the spirit is what makes us human, and uh, without that we would we would be something different. But you know, this is again this is built into the laws of the universe. That when you have something that's as complex as a human. The human spirit will dwell in it, and it'll be human, and it'll live. And so these these laws are basically they they the laws of the universe are basically they're immutable. They operate all the time. So given the right conditions, things always happen. So if, if they happen before, they'll happen again, again. And I think that applies to clones as well as you know. Can you say that the 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 sheep dolly was not a sheep because it was created by cloning? No, it was a sheep. It acted like a sheep. It didn't have any difference between how Dolly behaved and, and other sheep. Well, it looks like that's all of our questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Mahanian, for this really interesting talk. And thank you everyone for your questions as well. Thank you everyone for attending. It's been lovely to spend time with you. And I, I wish I could hear your voices, but maybe another day. Thank you. And for those who you know want to listen again or share with your friends, this uh, video will be up on our YouTube channel um, next week. And our speaker next week will be Faith Holmes. And the topic will be moving from stress and anxiety into creation. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. Thank you so much again. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you to the organizers. Thanks.